So let's follow the time-tested method of plant identification, which employs a process that considers the known features of a plant specimen, and then rejects in and all plant groups that lack those features. In this manner, we can follow a logical process of elimination to waive all plant groups that are unlikely possibilities with hopes of ending up with a plant species determination that is consistent with available botanical data garnered from Vedic scriptures and archaeological records. And of course, our botanical considerations must be consistent with the ecological and floristic constitution of the Punjab. So to begin, let's first consider the name of the plant itself, Soma, which Sanskritists agree is a title that derives from the Sanskrit word root, Su, meaning to press, to press out. Vedic refrains re refer constantly to the crushing and pressing of Soma plant stems, the Sanskrit term for stem being Amshu. Extractions of the plant's juices required the use of two flat stones or flat boards, so we can assume the stems were tough enough to require the use of a mortar and pestle, but were probably not all that woody, for how can two flat boards press juices out of woody stems? Also, the expressed juices are described as being either green, milky white, or strangely, if we consider current translations of the hymns to be accurate, yellow and red. Now, no plant that I've ever examined, and I have examined many thousands of species, produces sap of four different colors. And it is noteworthy that the colors yellow and red are constantly employed to describe the resplendent features of the plant itself, its body, not the sap. So I'm convinced that there might be some confusion here in, in translating references to the plant's natural exudates with the references to the plant's vegetative characteristics. Soma sap, which Arians refer to as rasa, meaning either literally essence or flavor, was often mixed with either milk or yogurt, and sometimes with additional barley grains, barley meal, or rice cakes. The Sama Veda makes direct reference to the greenness of the Soma sap during the pressing process, while the Rig Veda describes the mortar pressing stones as being green mouth, which I assume relates to uh, a green tinge that's left on the stones. To quote the Samaveda, the purifying green-colored moon plant juice, uttering its own praise, rests upon the womb of its water-containing receptacle. Such is the tenor of a, a typical verse from the, from the Samaveda. But more often than not, the sap is described as whitish, as milky, which clearly indicates that we are dealing with a plant that produces a milky latex, something in the vein of sap that is tapped, for example, from rubber trees of Brazil. One passage of the Rig Veda states, the steer strong juice, like milk, pours forth for the feast and service to the gods. This comes from a hymn dedicated directly to Soma Pavamana. Or in the same group of hymns, we have this verse. The Lord of plants, Vanaspati, Soma, whose praises never fail, provides heavenly milk for our hymns. Or in the Samaveda, we find the far-seeing, the wise, obtained the concealed milk, treasured up in those bounteous cows. But those cows are actually symbolic aspects of soma stalks on account of their milky latex, as we shall soon un 
uh, explore. And it so happens that multi-latex is in fact a very useful and helpful diagnostic trait in flowering plant identification because only a very small percentage of the world's 400 vascular plant families exhibit this trait. When you cut the stems or trunk of a lactiferous plant, as they're called, white latex typically squirts out profusely as a wound response. And in general, it's thought that the white and bitter latex of a plant serves as a deterrent to herbivorous animals. One example of a flowering plant family that is famous for its white la latex is, well, you guessed it, the milkweed family, the Asclepiadaceae, named after the Greek god of medicine Asclepius. Sarcostema, for example, a tropical viney member of the milkweed family, produces a horrible smelling latex when the stems or leaves are broken. Since this milkweed group occurs in the lowlands of India and grows as a creeper, various local Indian communities have referred to the vines as soma. But like ephedra, the joint pine, Sarcostema vines share few physical features with the Vedic soma plant and has no known stimulating or psychotropic properties. The milky qualities of soma sap is emphasized over and over again, just as countless hymns refer to the pressing process of soma stems as a milking procedure. You milk the stems. To quote but one refrain of the Samaveda, the Brahmins are milking out the resplendent white milk. This forms the primeval gift conferring, all seeing body of this moon plant sacrifice. And the latex is occasionally described in various Vedic texts as foaming forth, suggesting an observable viscosity, one would assume, to the sap. This too is typical of most plants that exude milky latex. Now the white sapped stems of soma are described as having not one, but two distinct growth habits. The Sanskrit terms soma vali and soma lata suggest that the plant had creeping stems. But more often than not, soma is described as having a robust, upright shoot. This does not necessarily introduce a contradiction, as more than a few translators have suggested, because many land plants produce both prostrate and upright stems. Well-known examples including ginger plants, turmeric, bamboos, or all grasses for that matter, or potatoes, strawberries, and many other plants from our farms and wild fields. More often than not, the soma plant is described as erect and overtly so, because soma, as a plant god, presents himself to the natural world as a prominent and steadfast pillar. In Sanskrit, a stanu or a skambha, Soma stood out as a veritable pillar of the earth and sky, a divo darunam, heavenly support, which Vedic chanters identified metaphorically as a well-adorned support of dharma and rita. The former, dharma meaning truth, rita meaning rightness or righteousness. Since Soma was called in some chants the Lord of Dharma, and since the word Dharma shares a common word root with the aforementioned name of the, of the plant, like Divu Dharunam, the word root Dhar, meaning literally in Sanskrit to support, clearly alludes to the plant's conspicuous upright stems. Yet these vegetative pillars are said 
to occur in multitudes, not solitarily, as one might expect, say, from a tree with a trunk. Soma sometimes displays its erect shoots literally by the hundreds, or even by the thousands, suggesting the image of a prodigious population of vegetative pillars. Perhaps something in the likeness of spider lilies or amaryllis plants, which produce from underground uh, clones of upright shoots. Still, while references to this type are common in all four Vedas, they are interspersed as well with occasional references to a creeping snake-like growth habit, which apparently develops segment by segment, the verses say, or knot by knot. To quote both Rig Veda and Yajurveda, we have, O plants, you creep member by member, joint by joint. Or another refrain, let your shoot be joined with shoot, joint with joint. Let your scent further our desire. The somic references paint a picture of a prostrate creeping stem, whether that might be an above ground runner or an underground stem, which botanists refer technically to as a rhizome. Stems of such type, the underground rhizomes, are common in the plant kingdom. And they often exhibit well-defined segments, which botanists refer to technically as stem nodes and internodes. This aspect of the plant likely relates to recurrent references to Soma's creeping form as a serpent, a serpent who slithers out of his old skin when he grows. To quote the Rig Veda, Sing forth to Soma Pavamana, skilled in holy song. The juice is flowing, onward like a mighty stream. He, Soma, glides like a serpent from his ancient skin, and like a playful horse the tiny steer has run. Soma's close symbolic associations with a cosmic bull or steed is a topic we will address shortly. But this mythic image obviously differs from Soma's more typical image as a mainstay, a, a pillar of the sky. Another description of Soma's stems implies the general aspect of a pointed arrow. These passages referring to the upright shoot specifically. Soma's stems are said to arise like an arrow's shaft, quote unquote. Vedic hymns employ various words for the stem's arrow-like aspect, including the Sanskrit terms sharya, sharu, and bana, all of which are said to point upward. Again, from the Rig Veda, we hear impetuous, strong, armed like arrows is Soma. Forest trees and all the bushes cannot deceive Indra by their likeness. Or again, your powers, Soma, have lifted themselves up. Urge on your arrows, sharpen point. Frequent references to Soma's upright shafts in the form of a reed or cane, a vana or a vitasa, also suggest a similar form, which is to say, a straight and narrow stem but perhaps without the jointed features mentioned earlier, since the aspect of a vegetative arrow would probably lack prominent segments. This same image is also implied in a Vedic mythic context, which identifies Soma the, as a plant god and as a cosmic archer, Shardava by, Shardava by name. When doing so, Soma assumes this form and function to shoot his arrows into dark aquatic serpents, a theme we will explore shortly. This title, Shardava, would later be adopted by the Hindu god of destruction, Shiva. Now, from a botanical perspective, 
Stems of land plants can vary incredibly within and between plant families. So stems have limited use in diagnosing plant groups, much less in diagnosing plant species. Nevertheless, the aforementioned vegetative characteristics in combination do in fact eliminate the vast majority of plants of the Punjab, thus allowing for some progress in the identification process, especially by casting doubt on many former botanical proposals. <laughs>